Hi, uh, good evening everyone. So this week we are back again and we'll be discussing another drug in our series on antifungals in dermatology. We have discussed two major antifungals in the previous weeks. One is terbinafine, other is etraconazole. And this week the video would be a bit shorter. There's not much to fluconazole as such. And if you have gone through uh, my video on etraconazole, uh, understanding fluconazole would be much, much easier. They belong to the same class of antifungals. Uh, they share a lot of adverse effects. They share a lot of, uh, uh, you could say, the clinical parameters where they are going to act or the spectrum of action against the diseases. Uh, one good area where fluconazole actually, in my opinion, triumphs over itraconazole or other azoles is candida. Okay, so in candidal infections, I usually prefer fluconazole. I uh, use fluconazole for candidal balinopostitis, uh, vaginal candidiasis, it's a drug of choice for vaginal candidiasis. So uh, these, there are certain limited areas for use of fluconazole in the current scenario. The reason being that, that because over the course of uh, multiple years, the organism, so the fungus has now developed a good amount of resistance against fluconazole. Subsequently, in, in various studies, we are routinely seeing that the MIC values or the minimum inhibitory concentration of fluconazole for different uh, fungal organisms are increasing after a certain threshold and thus it makes fluconazole not a good drug to be used against fungal infections. Uh, especially dermatophytic infections like uh, tinea corporis and crudis, it becomes difficult to use fluconazole because it has it has lost its uh, action against them. Okay, so we'll have to know a certain limited indications for the use of fluconazole, and uh, so that we may able to limit the use of fluconazole to that indications. We don't we don't unnecessarily keep on prescribing uh, drugs for uh, various infections in which it, it has not shown to be a good uh, antifungal agent. So with this video, I, I hope to make it easier to understand on these limited indications where we can use fluconazole. And with that being said, I'll start and we'll discuss the drug this week, which is fluconazole in dermatology. So let's start about uh, regarding the introduction of fluconazole. It is a first generation triazole. We have already told you that you have uh, allyl amines. Okay. You have allyl amines. You have azoles. You have uh, echinocandins. There are other, other classes of antifungals also and if any of you would want a separate video on classification of antifungal drugs, a short video, just mention that in the comments below. Maybe in the future I'll make one short video about classification of antifungal drugs. It, it becomes very easy to remember and you can pick your own favorites for certain fungal infections and indications. Okay. Now azoles are divided into two subclasses. You have imidazole. And then you have triazoles, depending on number of nitrogen atoms in each of the ring structures which we see in azoles. So fluconazole is a first generation triazole and it got approval for, uh, for usage in fungal infections in 1990. When we say approval, it means FDA approval. Okay. The, it, it's available as a tablet in concentrations of 50 milligram, 100 milligram, 200 milligram, 150 milligram, various concentrations are available but we usually do all the permutations and combinations when we are using a higher dose of fluconazole, okay? It's available as an oral solution also, ranging from 10 milligram per ml to 40 milligram per ml. So you have to titrate the dose as per the age and weight of the child if you're using it in pediatric population. So it's it's a good, uh, it's, it's fortunate that we have different classic, uh, different concentrations of fluconazole starting from 10 milligram per ml to 40 milligram per ml and so that we can easily titrate it. It's also available as an IV infusion in 2 mg per ml. IV infusion in dermatology, I've seen it being used in resistant, not resistant per se, that is not a correct word. Maybe I'll use uh, complicated, yeah. Complicated or recalcitrant vulvovaginal candidiasis. Otherwise, it is also used to treat cryptococcal meningitis. Since this is not a 
you know a skin indication so i was not covering it but i've i've seen people respond to iv infusion of fluconazole when they were not responding adequately to oral okay so uh, in pediatric age groups the dose is about 3 to 6 mg per kg per day you can go as high as 8 mg per kg per day but that is only when you're using fluconazole in a pulse form okay so remember uh, from the steroid lecture what is the definition of pulse it's a drug which has you which is used in a supra pharmacological doses okay but for a shorter shorter spike of time a short period of time okay so when you're using it sorry when you're using fluconazole pulse you increase the dose to about 8 mg per kg per day otherwise the pediatric dose hangs around uh, 3 to 6 mg per kg per day clear yeah so let's move forward fluconazole absorption is not affected by food intake so you can use the easily use them in pediatric population where the food they will be eating something or the other it undergoes little hepatic metabolism okay that means in cases of uh, when your patient is having liver derangement enzyme derangement fluconazole becomes a good antifungal agent to be used additionally the effect on the hepatic enzymes effect on the cyp family of enzymes is minimal with fluconazole it does have an effect on hepatic enzymes but the effect is minimal for fluconazole the effect was much larger with itraconazole but with fluconazole the effect is less and because of this effect being less it has minimal drug drug interactions so there are two benefits that you get from decrease effect on cyp enzymes number 1 less interactions with other drugs and number 2 the doses can remain a bit same in liver derangements okay so in liver derangement the dose can you don't have to decrease the dose per se just titrate it according to the indication and body weight of the patient peak levels are reached in 1 to 2 hours bioavailability is more than 90% and this is one of the highest bioavailability in antifungal agents or not in antifungal in azoles okay remember that for fluconazole it was roughly about 55% while for uh, sorry i misspoke for itraconazole it was maximum 55% but for fluconazole it is more than 90% and protein binding is just 11 to 12% so a lot of free drug is present in the circulation okay so this high bioavailability makes it very useful as an oral agent okay half life is 30 hours some articles mention 60 to 90 hours but that is because when they are considering diffusion from skin now what happens is if this is skin and this is blood vessel so fluconazole is in the blood it goes inside the skin and remains there for some time when the level of fluconazole in the blood decreases the drug diffuses back from the skin to the serum so we are talking about two half life one half life is in the serum which is about 30 hours and another half life is in skin which is longer 60 to 90 hours because it stays in the skin am i clear on that so if we can write everything again okay if we can write everything again then this t half is the serum t half while 60 to 90 hours is the half life from skin clear excretion is that fluconazole is excreted as an unchanged molecule about 80% in urine 11% as metabolites of fluconazole and roughly 2% is excreted via fecal matter since majority of the excretion is from urine you have to have good working kidneys for it to be you know given so whenever there is uh, patients with creatinine clearance less than 50 you decrease the dose by 50% in other words you half the dose of fluconazole if you were planning to give 100 mg you give 50 mg okay so you decrease the dose in case of kidney derangement so we have learned a bit about pharmacology of fluconazole clear let's move forward So this is the same diagram that we have used in uh, the last two videos, and we are just focusing on the azoles. They act on the cytoplasmic membrane by interfering the synthesis of ergosterol. Clear? So the mechanism of action remains same as itraconazole. Okay. So in the last slide, we have learned about the mechanism of action of fluconazole as being a being a member of the family of azoles. it interferes with ergosterol synthesis and ergosterol is essential for fungal cell membrane formation okay 
So let's discuss about pharmacology of fluconazole in skin. It accumulates after a bolus weekly doses. So in various articles it has been mentioned that if you use a bolus dose of 150 mg a week, it will lead to a better skin accumulation when compared to 50 mg a day. Okay, so it's always better if you use a higher dose and give it as weekly boluses. Okay, so keep on giving a higher dose for, uh, on, in a weekly manner and that will lead to a better accumulation into the skin and the site of action. The major uh, way, major pathway that fluconazole reaches skin is through sweat. So that means that it becomes a very good drug to be used in tinea manum, tinea pedis, candidal intertrigo. Why? Because these are the areas where the patient will tend to sweat a lot. Okay. So if there's a lot of sweating in the area, you give fluconazole. So a lot of the drug is present at the site. If you want to use, uh, see here, the the level, sorry, the pathway through which is fluconazole reaches skin is very limited through sebum. So areas which are seboric, for example, scalp, fluconazole is not that good a drug. So uh, if you want to use, uh, to, if you want to use a drug to treat fungal infections in seboric areas, you might want to switch to itraconazole that has much better sebum mobility, while fluconazole has more sweat mobility. So keep you uh, keep fluconazole for areas which are more sweaty or flexural or flexural okay uh, high levels are achieved in skin and it remains in skin after discontinuation remember in the last last slide t half in the serum was about 30 hours while in skin it was 60 to 90 hours roughly double to triple and after the dose after the levels of fluconazole start to decrease in serum or decrease in blood the drug diffuses back from the skin to the blood vessels okay so it essentially acts as a source of fluconazole after the treatment is stopped and that is why it remains in skin after discontinuation and the levels are also detected after discontinuation we are clear about that let's move forward now in nails fluconazole has been detected within one day and it has been detected at the distal point distal point of the nail so what we can deduce from that is that fluconazole diffusion into the nail plate occurs through the nail bed. This is a nail. So it occurs through the nail bed also through the nail matrix and nail folds also. So a lot of drugs gets accumulated inside the nail plate and the levels are seen within one day. It is directed within one day. If you use a 150 milligram a week bolus for the next 12 months, it is directed after six months, even after stopping the treatment. Okay. So in areas where you are treating fungal infection of nail or onychomycosis, especially onychomycosis which are because of candidal species, fluconazole becomes your drug of choice. If it's more of a dermatophyte infection, consider terbinafine, consider itraconazole. But if you're suspecting candida to be the cause or if you have candidal, candidal peronychia, consider fluconazole. Am I clear on that? Let's move forward. So in hair, fluconazole is not much used. Uh, there are only few case reports of its use to be uh, of its use in tinea capitis, but the diffusion in hair doesn't matter much. Remember, where are the hairs most abundantly on the scalp? Scalp is a seboric area. Fluconazole doesn't uh, go much with sebum, so it's not much of a use in tinea capitis. Okay, so it's better to use itraconazole or griseofulvin or terbinafine in that indications. In some studies, it has been detected for four to five months after stopping treatment. That is there, but the efficacy in tinea or capitis or efficacy in uh, you could say fungal infections over the scalp, it is not much useful. There are better drugs available, so consider those drugs. Okay, so we are. Uh, so in the previous slides, we have learned about the pharmacology of fluconazole in skin, nail and hair. Just to recap, these are the same slides from the itraconazole video. We'll just recap how it acts. The mechanism of action is inhibition of lenosterol 14 alpha demethylase. Okay. And that is required for conversion of lenosterol to 14 alpha demethyl lenosterol. And this is one of the pathways from uh, for ergosterol synthesis. So when this area, this conversion gets blocked, there is increased lenosterol 
and decrease ergosterol and deficiency of ergosterol which is res responsible for cell membrane activity for the fungus the drug is fungistatic so ergosterol is an important molecule that fungus needs to make its own cell membrane okay and uh, uh, since the cell membrane is not properly formed because of deficiency of ergosterol it leads to growth uh, arrest of fungus and that is why fluconazole is a fungistatic drug So we have seen the same picture before, we have seen it in terbinafine, we have seen it in etroconazole. Uh, again, the azole, the fluconazole is going to act similarly, it's going to inhibit the enzyme 14-alpha demethylase which is responsible for conversion of lenosterol to 14-alpha demethyl lenosterol. This step doesn't happen, okay, this step does not happen and you have increased lenosterol, okay. So there is increase in the levels of lenosterol and decrease in level of ergosterol. So ergosterol is not formed properly, it's not formed in the, prior, in the required concentration which the fungus needs to make a proper cell membrane and when the cell membrane is not formed properly, the growth stops and that is why fluconazole is also fungistatic. Okay, so if you are, if you are, uh, if you are inhibiting 14 alpha demethylase like all azoles, you become fungistatic, clear? Easy enough to remember now, you don't have to remember who is which, which drug is fungicidal, which drug is fungistatic, clear? So, the cell membrane doesn't form, lenosterol is increased because of inhibition, ergosterol is decreased, clear? That's all we need to know. Let's discuss the FDA approved use of fluconazole. I told you this video will be very short if you have gone through the etroconazole video and uh, we'll, we'll very 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 quickly is go, we are going to understand the uses of fluconazole. Now FD approved uses are in candidiasis, in vaginal candidiasis, in oropharyngeal candidiasis, in esophageal candidiasis and also as a prophylaxis for fungal infection after immunosuppression, radiotherapy or chemotherapy. So if any of your patient is suffering from any deep fungal infections, especially actions against you know cryptococcus, it's very very good drug against cryptococcus not that much against aspergillosis but uh, we do use at as a, we do use fluconazole for prophylaxis for aspergillosis but the action is not that good so these these three indications are more or less part of venereology so we have to take care of uh, usage of fluconazole in these indications and if you see those indications we are actually targeting the candidal species not much so as uh, not much so as dermatophytes but mostly candida okay so let's discuss them in little bit of detail okay <clears throat> so in the last slide we learned about the use of fluconazole in candidal infections and we'll just learn about the doses to be used in candidal infections this is not at all advice for the lay population this is directed towards teaching residents on how to use you have to consult a dermatologist or venereologist if you want to get yourself treated properly otherwise you'll end up in big big trouble so for cutaneous candidiasis the dose is 150 mg a week for 2 to 4 weeks depending on the response for vaginal candidiasis you can easily use 150 mg a single dose stat that's what we use in uh, syndromic management don't we this is a very bad hand very pathetic yeah, so this is what we use in treatment in syndromic management, don't we? So it's candidal 150, uh, sorry, vaginal candidiasis 150 mg single dose or you give 150 mg once a day for 3 days per week then weekly for 6 months. This is used when it's recurrent. Okay, so if you have a pers if you have, if you have a patient who has recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis, you give 150 mg for 3 days for 1 week and after that give it weekly for the next 6 months. Remember that bolus weekly doses of fluconazole are much better acting uh, than daily doses. The side effects are also less. So this is for prevention, for a prophylaxis kind of thing for a person who is having recurrent infections. For oropharyngeal candidiasis, you give 200 mg on one day and then 100 mg once a day for two weeks. Clear? You give, two, you give 100, uh, 200 mg on day one and then every day for the next 14 days or for the next 13 days, total 14 days, okay. For esophageal candidiasis, it's the same regimen, the only difference is that from 2, it is now changed to 3. 
So you give 200 milligram on day one, then 100 milligram once a day for three weeks till there is resolution, there is complete resolution. Clear? So esophageal candidiasis, you need to give it till complete resolution happens. So when we want to use fluconazole for nicomycosis caused by dermatophytes or let's say trichophyton uh, or mycosporin species, not the candidal species, it is it has not been approved for the usage of uh, fluconazole when they when onychomycosis is caused by those species. Better is to use them when candida is a suspect. Okay, so the dose is 150 to 200 milligram weekly every week until the abnormal appearing nail has grown grown out. Okay, so we remember that we have nail and if we have the distal involvement, the most common one, distal involvement. So we have to keep on giving 150 milligram a week till the whole nail becomes normal. Clear? That's the way. So mycological cure rate has been found for fingernail roughly about 89 to 100. That means KOH is negative, fungal cultures are negative after treatment. So this, this has been seen in 89 to 100% of uh, patients while 48% is seen in toenails. Okay, toenails being thicker, slow growing and you know, more compacted. It, it can show a very low response as compared to fingernails. Clinical cure rates, that means mycological cure rate plus the whole nail becoming normal, completely uninvolved is seen in 76 to 90% and 45% for toenail. Okay. If if you uh, kind of you know take nail scrapings and culture it out and look at under the microscope and you think it's candida which is causing the onychomycosis you start the dose with 300 milligram a week for six weeks for fingernail and if you're treating for toe nails it is 12 weeks okay so it has been found you can uh, it has been found that when candida is a species fluconazole acts wonderfully so there you can use fluconazole if you want to use a daily doses, you can substitute the pulse dose by using 50 mg a day for fluconazole. But as I said, as I've already said, that pulse forms or the weekly boluses of fluconazoles are much, much better if we want to use fluconazole against fungus. Okay, and uh, it has been found in some studies that it still enjoys high MIC values in pediatric population. So if you're going to treat the children, if you're going to treat fungal infection in children, fungal infections in children, then fluconazole does become a good choice or at least one choice to consider. Clear? Let's move forward. <clears throat> so we have talked about the use of fluconazole in onychomycosis. We'll discuss about dermatophytic infection, that is the skin infection, the skin fungal infections. The fluconazole has, uh, has not been found better than other azoles. Consider using itraconazole for dermatophyte. It has not, fluconazole is not much better as compared to itraconazole. It does show some activity, but there has been a rapid increase in resistance. Okay. So in various studies, if you, if you're really interested about uh, reading about what are MICs and how the MICs have been changing over the years for fluconazole, we have found that in various uh, literature, it is now increasing rapidly okay and uh, if i remember correctly uh, on the top of my head if i remember correctly then the mic values is now reaching roughly 32 or something 32 or 64 i don't remember the units but this is the uh, term that i this is the number that i remember and uh, the fluconazole this is the amount of fluconazole or the mic or the minimal inhibitory concentration that means minimum you have to be you have to be present at this level at the site to kill the fungus and this level has gradually been increasing over the past many years, making fluconazole not a good drug to treat skin fungal infections. Okay. Still, there are th those regimens for tinea corporis, crudis, pedis, you have 50 to 100 milligram till there is cure. Okay. While for tinea capitis, since we are using for pediatric age group, the dose is 6 mg per kg per day. You give it for 3 weeks. Okay. And if you are using pulse form, you give higher dose, 8 mg per kg per week for 4 to 8 weeks. Be clear on that this is just for your academic interest but usually I, I would not prefer fluconazole for treating dermatophyte infection the mic values are very very high there's no point in using that okay let's move forward on non-dermatophytic fungal infections fluconazole has found to have poor action against histoplasmosis blastomycosis paracoxidiomycosis 
However, it does have good action against cryptococcus. Cryptococcus. That's why it's used as a prophylactic agent for cryptococcal meningitis. And uh, remember, fluconazole has good blood-brain barrier penetration. So that's why we use fluconazole as a good prophylaxis against cryptococcal meningitis. See here? If we want to use it for treatment of pitreous versicolor, the dose is 400 mg single dose, stat single dose. Or you can give 200 mg for a week. Then 300 mg every two weeks if it is recurrent. Okay? But usually 400 mg single dose is good enough. Although I personally prefer itraconazole if I am going to treat a pitreous versicolor. Okay? But fluconazole can be used. Clear? So in the past few slides, we have learned about fluconazole mechanism of action, how it's a good drug against candida, not so good against uh, trichophyton and, uh, and microsporin species. Let's quickly discuss the adverse event. I would suggest you that you go back to the itraconazole video and look at the adverse event part of the video because there I have discussed in detail about the adverse events associated with azole group of drugs and some specific for itraconazole. And that's why I'll rapidly go through the adverse events uh, video, sorry, adverse event segment of fluconazole because the most, most of the, I would say 80 to 90% adverse events are shared by the other azole groups. So the itraconazole video is good enough and we'll just quickly discuss the adverse events associated with fluconazole. Clear? Let's move forward. So cross reactivity is present among azoles. For example, if a patient is resistant to itraconazole, there's a high chance they may be resistant to fluconazole as well. Side effects include headache, which is the most common side effect, roughly seen in 13% of patients, followed by abdominal pain and nausea, around 7 to 8%. Usually, the discontinuation rate, and it means the number of patients who stop fluconazole because of side effects, is roughly around 1.3 to 1.5%, always less than 2%. So, it's not that bad a drug. There are cardiac issues like all azoles, it can cause arrhythmias, congestive heart failure, cannot, should not be used in patients having ventricular dysfunction. It leads to decreased cardiac contractility. Contractility, okay? And that is because of negative, negative, inotropic effect. And this is the same effect that we have seen in itraconazole. So that's why there's sharing of adverse events. <coughs> okay. Overdose of fluconazole has been shown to cause hallucination and paranoia. And you have to manage it symptomatically. You have to make sure that the patient is vitally stable, is able, is sedated so that it, uh, the par paranoia is not that much a problem. And... Uh, uh, dialysis should also be considered. Why? Because remember, fluconazole is excreted 80% in urine uh, as, as an unchanged molecule. So if we repeat that process, if we can easily repeat it and get it out of the system, filter it, that's what a dialysis is. It's a standalone or a standby for kidneys. So if we can filter it from the circulation, we can easily remove it. So dialysis should be considered if the doses are very high or if the patient is highly symptomatic. Clear? Let's move forward. So this is the drug risk profile for fluconazole from Wolverton. So contraindications are hypersensitivity. Anytime you have to mention an absolute contraindication, you can, you should mention hypersensitivity to either drugs or components of formulation. This is one thing that we, in our exams, we never mention, but this is one good point. You should start that side effects of this drug include, uh, sorry, Absolute contraindications to fluconazole includes any hypersensitivity reactions to fluconazole or components of the formulation. Specific side effects include and then you go into uh, enumerating the different side effects that you have learned. But it's, it's always a good idea in Vigos to mention that hypersensitivity is to be looked forward. So there can be interactions with drugs. Remember fluconazole causes uh, less interactions. But any drug which might prolong QT because fluconazole itself is going to prolong QT causing arrhythmias. So two drugs which are going to increase the QT segment will lead to arrhythmias and will lead to deleterious effects. So let's be very careful about it. There are no box warning as such. 
so in liver in serious hepatic toxicity can be caused by using fluconazole for longer period or higher doses okay it does undergo limited hepatic metabolism but it is detoxified by the liver so in cases it has in uh, some of the cases uh, or not some of the cases but it has been reported to cause severe liver injury like other azoles itraconazole is very infamous for causing liver injury hypersensitivity reaction like rare exfoliative skin reactions they have been reported of, of for steven johnson syndromes they have been reports of fixed drug eruption uh, with fluconazole uh, there have been reports of of course drug induced maculopapular eruption so these all things have been reported with fluconazole for uh, dermatological side effects now pregnancy prescribing status is unrated the older one is unrated while for newer rating is moderate to higher risk and if you give single dose fluconazole especially in uncomplicated vulvovaginal candidiasis single dose fluconazole has low risk rating so you can use in uh, pregnant females i will discuss this unrated one in subsequent slides don't worry the ratings are different if you are using for vulvovaginal candidiasis as a single dose uh, in comparison to use of fluconazole for different indications so the pregnancy category differs a bit so we'll discuss that when we'll come to it clear so when you want to mention any uh, any uh, side effect profile for fluconazole just include liver damage heart damage because of qt prolongation and arrhythmias and uh, hypersensitivity reactions like sgst and fd pregnancy status as uh, unrated but you have to mention the newer rating which is moderately moderately high risk while for single dose it is low risk okay let's move forward now these are the drug reaction uh, i'm just enumerating i'm just listing the drug reaction of fluconazole if you have gone through the itraconazole video this is the same video the same slide because uh, the azoles share their drug interaction so if we can change the pen color yeah so azoles fluconazoles and uh, itraconazole they share their drug interaction so that's why volvertin mentions them uh, you know together and uh, yeah so they mention them together but remember that itraconazole has a lot of interactions with different drugs while fluconazole has lesser amount of interaction because it undergoes less hepatic metabolism and also it interacts less with the cytochrome p450 or cyp group of enzymes the major interactions are with cyclosporin and tacrolimus where the drug levels will be increased causing significant adverse events of these drugs for example fluconazole increases calcineurin inhibitors okay fluconazole increases calcineurin inhibitors fluconazole increases statins so side effects like myopathy and rhabdomyolysis can be seen much more commonly especially in elderly patients who are inadvertently started statins everywhere okay so make sure you ask about different drugs that your patient is taking you need to know now benzodiazepine fluconazole increases benzodiazepine causing increased sedation it increases antipsychotics in fact it is not at all recommended in combining fluconazole with any of these drugs any of these drugs as per the drug insert okay the interactions are not that good so make sure you take a good history from your patients okay so these are some low risk interactions low risk interactions are seen with rifampin rifabutin Rif what happens is that rifampicin it increases the metabolism of uh, itraconazole per se to some extent fluconazole thereby decreasing the drug level in the system but i will not be going to much detail in this slide because we have already discussed that in uh, discussed that properly in in detail while we were discussing itraconazole it's more or less the same so for pregnancy and lactation so as i said that the category the older category was different is pregnancy category c for vaginal candidiasis while is pregnancy category d for other indications so if you are using a single dose single 150 mg dose what is this writing yeah c and d so if just yeah so if you are using a single one single 150 mg doses okay so the category is c and if you are using uh, if you are using for any other indications the category is d 
Fluconazole is excreted in milk, so it is not recommended in lactating mothers. So you have to be very careful, and uh, you have to counsel the patient to take uh, proper, you know, uh, to to let them know that of course there will be uh, exposure of the neonate to fluconazole. However, in various studies, the effect has not found uh, to be any uh, detrimental to the health of the child. So I am just attaching two studies here. I will of course mention them in the description below. So if you really want to learn about what happens if fluconazole is given during pregnancy, go through these two articles. You will learn a lot. There has been reports of craniofacial, craniofacial and cardiovascular and musculoskeletal malformations if fluconazole is given. Okay. Uh, but this have been very rare. In fact, it has been found to have similar rate as compared to placebo. So these are rarer uh, teratogenic effects or the rarer defects of the fetus. And if you just want to mention it, that's why I'm mentioning it. Otherwise, these two statements I've taken. The first statement is from the first reference that oral fluconazole use during the first trimester of pregnancy appears to be associated with heart malformations and spontaneous abortions. But a causal link cannot be proven. Okay. The other line is that no effect on fetus more than placebos. This is from the second reference. So it has found to be much, much, much safer in pregnant females, especially if you are considering giving only one single dose. Okay. So the monitoring thing is very easy. It's same as citraconazole. Of course, you are supposed to change it depending from patient to patient. If your patient has risk factors for liver damage, like he is a regular alcohol drinker or he is hep B or hep C positive or he is taking any other drugs which might be hepatotoxic. For example, he might be on rifampicin for tuberculosis. So the LFT frequency increases. Otherwise, uh, if, the, the, if the duration of treatment is more than 3 to 4 weeks, consider doing LFT uh, I would uh, con and consider doing KFTs. Okay, you need to you need to have kidneys which are functioning properly. Okay, so KFTs and LFTs. You can easily do it uh, if you if you are considering longer durations. You can do it two weekly for at least uh, one month. That means two times. Then you can take it monthly for three months and then you can, con if, if it is prolonged than that, you might consider on a patient to patient basis. Now these are not some guidelines that I'm quoting, this is just based on personal experience. I usually use fluconazole as a bolus doses, weekly doses. I don't give daily doses, especially in uh, circumstances, let's say uh, in, uh, for example, I have had few patients who were scre getting themselves screened for diabetes. So I just gave them a daily dose. But if I'm considering giving daily doses, I don't give it more than two weeks. If I want, if I'm considering that the patient might require treatment for more than two weeks, I, I give weekly bolus doses. Okay. CBC, if the treatment is more than six weeks, why CBC? Because one of the side effects of fluconazole was found to be a granulocytosis, lymphopenia, leukopenia. These are the same side effects that are shared by the azole class of groups. They are majorly seen with itraconazole, but these side effects are very rare. So if you want to give fluconazole for a longer duration and I'm, tell, I'm talking about daily doses for more than 6 weeks, consider getting a CBC done too. Monitor for liver dis dysfunction, you might have to discontinue. Monitor for kidney dis dysfunction, you might have to discontinue. Majorly remember that if creatinine clearance is less than 50, you decrease the dose by 50%. Just remember this. Okay. So if in your if the, if you have a patient who is on uh, who is who is uh, who has chronic kidney disease for uh, let's say stage three or stage four of CKD, then and he has tenia uh, tenia manum tenia pd. These are very common infections in patients with uh, altered uh, in various comorbidities. And you want to use fluconazole, then consider using a very low dose. Start from a lower dose look at the functioning of the kidneys look if there's any dialysis being planned or not okay so if you have a patient who has renal impairment decrease the dose of fluconazole if it if at any given point of time the nephrologist wants to dialyze the patient wants to use dialysis the dose becomes normal the dose becomes back to the adult dose okay clear so if the kidneys are not functioning properly consider lower dose 
if if they are functioning properly or if the patient is on dialysis you may consider the normal adult dose clear remember that fluconazole is easily removed by dialysis that's one of the uh, methods to treat fluconazole poisoning or fluconazole you know overdosage okay so dialysis is okay that's perfectly fine so let's discuss the mechanism of resistance in fluconazole okay so it's fungus static in nature we have already told you about that and being fungus static the chances of resistance are high why because if the pay, if the drug is fungicidal it will kill the fungus but if it just slows the growth of fungus it gives time for the organism to develop various mechanisms to uh, counteract this kind of resistance okay so fungus static drugs are very much prone to resistances cross resistance are seen in uh, in among various other azoles especially in candida infections now what what are what are the mechanisms by which and fungal organisms can have resistance to fluconazole the major one is reduce susceptibility of lanosterol alpha d methylase enzyme this is the major action enzyme for fluconazole so there is reduced binding of fluconazole to the enzyme there is reduced uh, uh, reduced you know uh, action of fluconazole on the enzyme the enzyme is not blocked properly by fluconazole and that is why the enzyme is not inhibited properly and the fungus continues to live that is the reason one of the major reasons of resistance of fluconazole in candidal infections or any fungal infections per se there are some genes which are uh, you know which are mentioned one is candidal candidal resistance gene 1 and candidal resistance gene or candida resistance gene 1 and 2 and multidrug resistance genes 1 these are majorly genes which encode for efflux pumps so if you have gone through the video on etroconazole and terbinafin what do we what do we mean by efflux pumps so let's say this is a fungal cell i should not draw fungus cell like this actually let's draw it in green so if this is let's say a fungal cell let's say dimorphic fungus okay major action of fluconazole is against dimorphic fungi so if this is a fungal cell and you have drugs inside you have fluconazole inside there are certain pumps okay the action of this pumps are to throw the drug outside so what happens is they take the drug from the cytoplasm and throw them outside essentially removing them before they go and block alpha d methylase enzyme so cdr1 and 2 and mdr1 are the genes which encode for this pumps which are responsible for the action of this pumps and more the efflux pumps more the efflux of uh, fluconazole outside the cell and the cell is properly resistant to or can develop resistance to fluconazole other gene is erg1 which is responsible for encoding the enzyme target so for example for example let's say this is the 14 alpha d methylase enzyme okay and this is the fluconazole so this becomes the fluconazole binding site erg1 is responsible for coding this site if there's mutation in this gene the and the binding site might not be there now and fluconazole is not able to bind okay fluconazole is not able to bind and because of that the enzyme is not inhibited and there's resistance so what happens with erg1 is this alteration in binding sites leading to resistance of fluconazole so if we want to repeat everything very shortly there is decrease susceptibility of the enzyme there are some genes which are mentioned like candida resistance genes 1 candida resistance gene 2 and multidrug resistance gene 1 these are responsible for the efflux pumps erg1 is responsible for the enzyme target or alteration binding sites clear one more thing that i wanted to add this could be a good viva question that candida crusei crusei is resistant to fluconazole so remember multiple times i have said that fluconazole is a good drug against candidal species but candida crusei is inherently resistant to fluconazole now if if uh, none of us are going to culture candida per se to find out the species but just for academic interest is good to know one kind of species which is resistant to fluconazole clear so with that the lecture ends 
and uh, i told you it's a short uh, video i think it's roughly 40 45 minutes long and uh, if you have gone through the itraconazole video properly this will be a much faster video so i request you to see this video at, at 1.5 times the speed 1.5 x and you can easily go through and revise fluconazole it's a very good drug especially when you're treating candidal infections okay you're treating infections like vulvovaginal candidiasis or you're treating candidal intertrigo very good drug candid candidal balenopostitis balenitis and all that especially in patients who have uncontrolled blood sugars very good drug so if you want to learn more about fluconazole you can of course read the product insert the trade name is diflucan there are some of the articles that i've gone through these are good articles okay uh, this you can skip i've more or less covered this in the video lecture uh, weekly therapy a weekly fluconazole therapy for recurrent vvc this is a very good article so it will tell you a lot about it if you really want to learn about how to manage vulvovaginal candidiasis good article okay and these two articles are the pregnancy effects of uh, fluconazole so if you want to learn about keratogenicity or should you give it or should you not give it just go through these two articles once and your concept should be clear whether you should treat fluconazole sorry treat with fluconazole or not but i would uh, i have gone through these two articles but it's better to give fluconazole as long as you're giving it as a single dose 150 milligram single dose i mean gynecologists regularly use clotrimazole pessaries and it and it is right there it's better to give a systemic drug okay you have to do some mix and match on uh, on your basis on your knowledge okay okay so with that this week's video is finished we have discussed another antifungal this week uh, we have done turbinafine we have done itraconazole this week we have done fluconazole next week i'll discuss another azole ketoconazole and with that we are going to finish the systemic azoles uh, azole therapy uh, then uh, then we may discuss topical azoles or we can go straight forward to glycofulvin that's a this, uh, that, that's a decision i have not taken yet but this week we are just discussing fluconazole i will not take much of your time if there are any suggestions you may email them to me if there are any doubt any questions anything that i have said which is wrong tell me about it i'm willing to correct it tell me how to make this lectures more prop more uh, uh, properly done better for you to understand anything that i should improve comment all your suggestions doubts queries below let me know if you want a separate video on classification of antifungal drug it's very easy and we can easily make a video and discuss that with that uh, i'll finish uh, again uh, just 10 seconds for the middle eastern conflict let me people should learn how to use their brains it's it's just uh, completely unfortunate and disheartening so with that being said adios bye bye enjoy your weekend i shall meet you next week this time with ketoconazole